people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Public anger has spiraled into massive demonstrations in Sri Lanka as large crowds protested against the ruling dispensation of the country this week. People demanded the government's ouster as they leveled charges of ruining the country against Rajapaksas. The island nation has been struggling to contain the crisis that erupted in the wake of forex reserve depletion in the country. The residents have taken to streets as they say they are reeling due to the shortages of fuel, gas, food and even staples. And this has given rise to unprecedented inflation. Shouting slogans, demanding the government to resign. A number of groups held several protests in capital Colombo against the crisis they said they were enduring owing to government's incompetence. The Sri Lankan forex shortage that has plunged into a situation of crisis in the past few weeks has triggered unrest and chaos across the country. People are out on the streets expressing anger that the government tried to muzzle last week through imposition of emergency but lifted following both domestic and external condemnation. There are shortages of fuel and food. Prolonged power cuts have further crippled country's economy and people's everyday lives. The prices of fruits and vegetables have skyrocketed to more than double over the past few weeks, making the essential items out of reach for a commoner's plate. The reason why we have to hit the road is uh, there was a failure from the government eternally putting the pressure on the innocent people. Number one, we have been uh, criticized our daily routine, which is the prices hikes of every commodity. So we cannot bear it up. There is an uh, average that ordinary person bear it up. Persons like us, it's it's in the economical status where we cannot bear it up. So everybody, everybody who comes to the street having a reason, the reason uh, behind was the, uh, the major crisis was improper management of finance and economy. Over the past decade, the Sri Lankan government has borrowed vast sums of money from foreign lenders to fund public services. This borrowing spree has coincided with a series of hammer blows to the Sri Lankan economy from both natural disasters such as heavy monsoons to man-made catastrophes including a government ban on chemical fertilizers that decimated farmers' harvests. Sri Lanka then had to fall back on its foreign exchange reserves to pay off government debt shrinking its reserves from $6.9 billion in 2018 to a little over $2.3 billion this year. The country has to repay about $4 billion in debt over the rest of this year, including a $1 billion international sovereign bond that matures in July. Meanwhile, India, the island nation's neighbor, which it has been looking up for help, has stepped up its efforts in order to rescue the country from the crisis. Last week, a consignment of 40,000 metric ton of diesel under Indian assistance through a line of credit of $500 million was handed over to Sri Lankan government. 
earlier, India had also supplied 6,000 metric ton of fuel to the Ceylon Electricity Board. After providing Sri Lanka with a short-term credit line of $500 million earlier this year, New Delhi has committed to provide an additional $1 billion line of credit to Colombo. Meanwhile, the government has appointed a three-member team with international experience to help curb the crisis and engage with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. It says it is hopeful of an early solution. The Rajapaksa administration had assured the citizens of resolving the crisis in a few days last month. But the protracted issue is not seemingly getting over just as of now. Moving on. Indo-Nepal relationship seems to have received a fresh impetus with Himalayan nation's Prime Minister Sher Bahadur Deoba visiting India for three days last week. Entire gamut of ties was reviewed. The two sides also acknowledged and kicked off the jointly accomplished infrastructural projects. A joint statement was released that underlined both sides' commitment to resolve any form of hiccups and apprehensions through dialogue. PM Deoba also paid a visit to India's spiritual capital Varanasi, which emphasized the centuries-old cultural ties between the two. Experts have called it a productive engagement. One of my colleagues, Binod Prasad Adhikari, spoke to a Kathmandu-based senior journalist, Kosh Raj Koirala, to understand the developments better. Have a look. South Asian region is going through unprecedented uh, times with countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka undergoing different forms of political crisis. In such a time, how do you see the recent visit of Nepali Prime Minister Sher Bahadur Deva to India? Well, you're right. Uh, South Asian countries are, you know, like Pakistan and Sri Lanka in particular, they are, you know, going through very you know, different kinds of political situation. Uh, we just saw, like, Pakistani Prime Minister dissolve parliament and Sri Lankan, uh, you know, politics is also undergoing the same kind of problem. So uh, the visit of Prime Minister Deuba at this point of time, I think you know it has, you know, helped to restore the cordial relations that, you know, that exists between the two people. Uh, you know, we are culturally, uh, religiously, or you know, we are connected with each other through different um, linkages. I think uh, the visit was very important to restore the cordial relation um, you know between Nepal and India how do you look at the future of the ties between the two countries uh, where are they headed as of now according to you Prime Minister Deva visited India he just met uh, you know Prime Minister Modi his Indian counterpart and other ministers um, I think you know this this has tried to reaffirm the the close relationship that exists between Nepal and India. For example, Prime Minister Deva also visited Baranasi, the way where you know famous Nepali temple is also located. So that kind of shows that we have religious linkages. That that visit tries to restore that point. And also, although you know there was no like joint statement issued after the you know visit, but then there are certain agreements that have been reached between Nepal and India. For example, uh, this vision paper and power sector cooperation uh, between these two countries and uh, this I, I would say this is a landmark agreement between Nepal and India you know even in political circle there's a realization that we need to have closer cooperation with India and it is only with the help of uh, this closer cooperation in economic front that can help Nepal to you know achieve prosperity we have you know slogans like prosperous Nepal, happy Nepali. But there's a realization that this is possible only when we have very good relations with India and when we just, you know, enhance our economic cooperation with India. Uh, different prime ministers have seemingly pursued a different India policy in the past few years. What, according to you, is the correct policy, keeping in view the kind of development Nepal is looking at owing to joint efforts? Prime Minister Deva, since he is the Prime Minister of Nepali Congress, 
um, you know, Nepali Congress views India differently as compared to uh, other left political parties uh, in Nepal. So Prime Minister Deva, you know, naturally, um, or Nepali Congress, I will say, um, they, they naturally want to seek, you know, closer ties with India all the time. Um, and earlier we had like very close relation at the political level, but then not much had happened in the economic front. You know, this is time that we start enhancing our economic cooperation. That only helps like people will realize when people are able to just, you know, realize the benefit of economic cooperation with India, then I think our relation will, you know, uh, between these two countries, we are now linked with we call roti beti relations. I think this has to, many people in Nepal, they say that it should not be limited to roti beti only. Now I think electricity also has to be included there because that is the only, I mean, one of the biggest potential that we have and in which we can actually, uh, can, you know, enhance our cooperation. Moving on. As Russian invasion of Ukraine enters seventh week and there appears no light of peace at the end of the tunnel, the international community is finding it hard to put together a tangible solution to bring the fight to an end. The UN, US and the EU have doubled down their efforts to further isolate Russia, but this has prompted only one thing, escalation. Meanwhile, New Delhi, which has sent humanitarian assistance for the affected regions in the past, has unequivocally condemned the horrific images that have emerged from the Ukrainian town of Bucha. Since day one, India has held its position that it wants peace and have urged both sides to use diplomatic means to resolve the crisis. Pictures that shook the conscience of people around the world surfaced from Ukrainian capital Kyiv suburb Bucha this week. Corpses lying on roadsides, infrastructure turned into rubble and the destroyed heavy war machinery. This appears to be the tipping point. An attack that is largely being called as genocide marked the darkest day in the Russia-Ukraine conflict that has entered its seventh week. The West has leveled charges of Russia targeting the civilians, which Moscow has clearly denied. Meanwhile, Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jay Shankar strongly condemned what transpired in Bucha and urged for an independent investigation into the issue. While explaining New Delhi's position on the conflict, Jay Shankar said that it had chosen the side of peace. We are deeply disturbed by the reports. Uh, we strongly condemn the killings which have taken place there. This is an extremely serious matter and we support the call for an independent investigation. Meanwhile, the United Nations General Assembly suspended Russia from the UN Human Rights Council, citing gross and systematic violations and abuses of human rights by invading Russian troops in Ukraine. The US-led push garnered 93 votes in favor, while 24 countries voted no and 58 countries abstained. A two-thirds majority of voting members in the 193-member General Assembly in New York, abstentions do not count, was needed to suspend Russia from the 47-member Geneva-based Human Rights Council. Speaking after the vote, Russia described the move as an illegitimate and politically motivated step and declared it decided to leave the council altogether. New Delhi has so far abstained from most of the resolutions that have been brought against Russia. It has clearly indicated through its position that it will condemn all forms of violence but will not be coerced into giving up its diplomatic interests. We believe that no solution can be arrived at by shedding blood and at the cost of innocent lives. In this day and age, dialogue and diplomacy are the right answers to any disputes. And this should bear in mind that the contemporary global order has been built on the UN Charter, on respect for international law 
and for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states. If India has chosen a site, it is a site of peace. Last month, the US President Joe Biden had called Indian move shaky after it didn't fall in line with what apparently looked like Washington's instruction against Russia. While the other Quad countries, the United States, Japan and Australia have sanctioned Russian entities or people, India has not imposed sanctions on its biggest supplier of military hardware. India has time and again said it will never support war. Indian history and present corroborates its position, but has also given clear message to the world that it cannot be cowed down into taking a position against its interests. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Basra residents strolled between flower beds, roses and gardens at Basra's fifth flower exhibition, a flower and plant show that aims to encourage citizens to green their gardens. Enough with concrete cities that are full of stone, streets and asphalt, a retired teacher, Hassan al Dehar said, adding that he was hoping local authorities would increase their efforts in planting trees in the city. Climate change, wars and the oil industry are factors that contributed to desertification in Basra, a province once known for its gardens, orchards and palm groves. Flowers and plants exhibited included varieties that survived dry weather and more than 30 companies participated in the event. The exhibition will remain open to the public throughout the month of Ramadan offering visitors the opportunity to not only admire flowers but also buy them and spend refreshing moments in the grass areas dotting the exhibition grounds. Japan's Yaskawa company has developed an industrial robot with artificial intelligence which determines the color and shape of the objects and transport them to their correct position. Yaskawa company is evolving in various fields including the automobile industry and parts manufacturing according with the needs of the era. Yaskawa is promoting the solution concept i3 iQ mechatronics to realize a new industrial automation revolution. i3 means Integrated Intelligence Innovative. At the Industrial Robot Expo held in Tokyo this March, a demonstration including Yaskawa's latest technology attracted attention. In the demonstration, robots with different roles work properly. Each robot has artificial intelligence and works independently. The instructor robot gives efficient instructions to each robot about work situation. The robots communicate with each other to work autonomously and more efficiently. Yaskawa Electrics Technology has the mission to support global manufacturing industry continuously. This is the roadside station Kisarazu Umakuta no Sato in Kisarazu City, Chifa Prefecture. Inside the store, there is a large peanut statue. Chiba Prefecture produces the largest amount of peanuts in Japan and therefore is a local speciality here. A farm cafe, restaurant and tree is located in the corner of the store. It is a popular restaurant with a menu that uses plenty of local vegetables. In the popular meal menu, especially peanut soft cream is one of the restaurant's most popular one. The peanut soft cream is the original one of these restaurants created in consultation with the manufacturer Nissi, along with careful attention to the blending ratio so that the flavor of vanilla is not too strong and the peanut aroma is enhanced. The peanut soft cream was created in this way. It has the perfect balance of flavor to attract from small children to adults. This restaurant also sells soft ice cream made with Kisarazu's speciality blueberry. This soft cream provides crunchy feeling, which is similar to that of shaved ice. 
Furthermore, the unique shape of this soft cream is popular among tourists. Moving on. Various states in India recently welcomed their traditional New Year with festivals like Gudi Parva and Ugadi. Observed with great joy and enthusiasm, these festivals also celebrate the arrival of spring season. The month of April is all about celebrating various religious festivals with gusto and fervor. During this time, various states in India celebrate their traditional New Year with different names to mark the beginning of Chaitra month. In Maharashtra, it is observed as Guri Parva that leads up to Ram Navami, which is celebrated on the ninth day. The festival is observed with colorful floor decorations called Rangoli, a special Guri flag, street processions, dancing and festive foods. Also known as Brahma's flag, Guri is a bright green saffron or yellow cloth tied to the tip of a long bamboo over which sugar crystals, neem leaves, a twig of mango leaves and a garland of red flowers is tied. A silver or copper pot is placed in the inverted position over it. Then this goodie, which is regarded as a symbol of victory, is hoisted outside the house, especially at a high place, so that everybody can see it. आज सृष्टि का निर्माण हुआ था जो ब्रह्मा जी ने किया था उस अवसर पर हम लोग गुड़ी को गुड़ी की पूजा करते हैं और दूसरा जो राम भगवान ने विजय पाई थी इस वजह से वहां पे जब वो गुड़ी लेके मतलब तब से गुड़ी का एक दूसरी बात बोले तो वहां से विजय हुआ था मतलब विजय का एक प्रतीक है गुड़ी इस अवसर पर हम लोग गुड़ी पड़वा का जो परंपरा है वो तब से चली आ रही है और हम लोग सेलिब्रेट करते हैं Swagat Yatra or Shobha Yatra is a big part of Gudi Padva celebrations and is organized in various parts of the country. The procession that takes place is likely an explosion of colors, blending tradition with modernity. Several people, no matter youngsters or adults, join the Yatra and dance to the beat of dhols and tashas. This two-decade-old tradition marks the celebrations that were done for Lord Ram after his return to Ayodhya after completing 14 years of exile. Today, Sri Ram Chandra Jit Kar came to this day. Today, the name of Hindu Nauvar Sidi is called Hindu Nauvar Sidi. And in the whole of the Maharashtra, in the whole of Hindustan, this is Sri Ram Ji. जो जीत कर आए थे उसके वजह से सब लोग ये दिन मनाते हैं ये सारे हिंदुस्तान में अच्छे अच्छे तरह से रथ बनाए जाते हैं रैलियां बनाई जाती है सुबह सुबह सब पारंपरिक उनका गणवेश पहन के आते हैं और जोरों शोरों से बहुत जोरों शोरों से ये दिन ये जीत का महोत्सव मनाते हैं In Andhra Pradesh, the same occasion is observed as Ugadi and in Karnataka as Yugadi, which is assumed to be the first day of creation of Earth. On this day, people also visit the nearest temples and offer prayers so that the upcoming year brings good luck and blessings of the Almighty. As a number of festivals in India are often linked to the sowing and reaping of crops, Gudi Parva too marks the end of Rabi crop season. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.